Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the special showcase of the uh, major incidents report and Australia's Riskscape uh, report uh, showcase. My name is John Richardson. Uh, I'm the Manager of Knowledge Development at the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience. Really delighted to be uh, your host for this session. Uh, before we start and get into the proceedings, although I would really like to um, acknowledge uh, that we're hosting uh, the, this event from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation here in Nam, uh, and also acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of various lands that, that you are all joining us uh, from today, uh, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be participating in this event. I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present uh, and emerging and celebrate diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures uh, across uh, the lands and waters of Australia. And also acknowledge that you know, li living you know, for 60,000 years uh, with extreme weather and uh, various uh, geotechnical events, there's certainly uh, a lot that we, we can learn uh, as, as we navigate uh, some of the, the challenges that we, uh, we as a country. Um, you may be wondering uh, also why I'm wearing this uh, band T-shirt here. It's also Australian Music T-shirt Day. Uh, and this is um, uh, sort of an, an acknowledgement of all the, uh, the great people who um, bring uh, music to, to, our, um, uh, to our airwaves and, uh, and you know, to, to our listening. Um, the intersection of music and disasters is something that many of you know me, uh, is something I'm really sort of passionate about. And I just sort of reflect on an article I saw uh, during the week about uh, Jess Prednovic, who's a bassist with a, uh, a fabulous uh, West Australian punk band called The Shakies, uh, who also turned out as a volunteer firefighter and has been battling so the, the recent fires around Perth. So it's only put it, uh, new meaning to my T-shirt, even if, uh, with their song, Rock and Roll Saved My Life. Now, you're probably wondering why we're going on about music. I'll stop because what we're really here to do is, is to talk about these. Uh, so let's get on with the web, web, webinar. Uh, and a couple of sort of housekeeping things before uh, we get into the guts of it. Um, as you can see, you're, you're going to remain muted and your camera will, will uh, not be activated there. Uh, it's going to be recorded uh, and the presentation slides will be made available. Uh, we're going to be using the Q&A feature on Zoom to take your questions, so please do that. Feel free to have a conversation and chat. That's great, because uh, we like that. Uh, but um, if you want to ask a question, pop it into the Q&A and then we can kind of uh, make sure it's there and, and gets asked. Uh, if you really like a question, sum it up, uh, vote it up because that um, that that helps. Uh, you know, we we know who uh, uh, you know which ones that we might have to sort of prioritise. Um, please be respectful to to each other and presenters. Uh, you know, we, we we encourage respectful dialogue. Uh, it's something I think is sort of unfortunately we we seem to be losing the art of. So we can certainly, um, we can set the tone for that. We can be responsible for that. Um, I want you to let you know that also uh, there are images of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, uh, that are it, it being used in this webinar and also in the report. Uh, and also a reminder that the um, some of the topics and uh, images that, that are discussed uh, can be uh, triggering uh, or stressful for people. So, uh, uh, be aware of that and think about the sort of supports that you, you're on. Um, great to see that people are um, uh, already uh, popping in what uh, land, traditional lands or country that they're on. If you could do that, that would be great. Uh, feel free also, uh, given it is Oz Music T-shirt day, let us know your Australian, favourite Australian artist uh, and, and song, uh, and that you know, will give us a little bit more uh, uh, to go on. Um, so with that, uh, let's get the housekeeping out of the way and in, into the main act. Uh, and sort of first off uh, today, I'm really great to introduce uh, Daryl Glover, uh, who has been the, uh, the writer for, for this report. And I think Daryl and I first um, uh, sort of, uh, one of our first conversations was about um, Ed Cooper, uh, the legendary guitarist from, from the Saints. Uh, so it has, also has a, um, uh, a love of Australian music. So, Daryl, uh, over to you to just, just give us a, an outline of, of what we went through to, to get, get the report to where it is uh, now. Thanks, Daryl. 
Uh, hello, Daryl Glover. I think uh, thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think I had the I had the job as the as the writer of this report, and it's quite a uh, quite a glamorous term. But uh, principally, it's uh, is the project coordinator, doing the nuts and bolts and pulling all the bits and pieces together. Um, of course, that didn't happen alone. Uh, this is a national national product. Um, it's been in place since 2017. Uh, it's been produced annually. And its, uh, it's intention is to create an overview of all the major incidents uh, and events that have occurred over the previous financial year. It's actually framed by financial year. Um, now, major incidents, they include those that may be complex and cascading, require significant resource allocation, extended duration, major media or political interest, or pay, pose major learnings for the sector. Um, in this year's, the in the seventh report, uh, we've gone through the process of preparing that report and identified uh, 27 major incidents, which, you, which you'll see in there, uh, nine of which we then uh, chose to go on to do some further uh, investigation in case studies. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, uh, this didn't happen alone. Um, now, the uh, clearly Ada have a role uh, have a role here. We, we people who who pull this together, um, but of course it, the sponsor for the project is the National Emergency Management Agency through the Deputy Coordinator, uh, Deputy Coordinator General General of Emergency Management and Response, um, and ultimately the uh, this partnership uh, we work together. Um, between ADA, NEMA, and the emergency services, the chief officers in each state to begin to begin the product, uh, to begin this report. Um, now, it's uh, these are all big entities, um, and you'll see there that, of course, that uh, in a lovely little diagram there. Uh, we pulled together some steering committee from that from that group of people, um, and those uh, steering committee to uh, approve and support the process, and uh, then uh, each of the emergency services coordinated their expert input um, through their particular organisations. Um, that steering committee, uh, you know, they had to have all the ability to speak on behalf of their organisation and uh, and have the have uh, the skills and knowledge of what's being happened. Uh, within the last last year, um, none of this could happen though without the content providers, uh, those people who are on the ground, those people who have experienced uh, these events or been involved in the reviews or learnings, and uh, they are the ones who uh, who worked with closely uh, to bring together the product, um, uh, the report. Uh, at my end, of course, uh, it wasn't just myself. It's uh, myself and John and uh, Isabel Corns uh, as a as a project group to pull this together. Uh, it's a. Uh, I'm sorry. Next uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, look, you can't read the details on that, but uh, it's a. Even though there's lots of steps in it, it's a fairly uh, fairly concentrated process. Um, being framed around the end of the financial year. Uh, there's a real focus on trying to bring that information together. Uh, I asked a lot of people to provide me uh, lots of information uh, on generally on, on quite short notice and uh, to pull the, pull the report together on each of the, but firstly, the incidents uh, that uh, we believed or they believed uh, were of national significance and then the details of those incidents that we've thought to take forward into the case studies. Um, technically, we started in May. Um, we finished in uh, early September where the, the, uh, the report was used as part of the, uh, the annual high-risk weather briefing of NEMA. Next slide. Now I'm I'm moving through this quite quickly because really I'm not sure that everyone wants to know how you know how much that uh, you know who spoke to whom and when, um, but uh, what we did come down to and uh, I found this map uh, particularly useful and definitely an improved product on, on on what I started with. So again, thank you to the editing team for for making sure that this really looked uh, as good as it could. Um, but we had uh, sorry 27 incidents uh, that uh, major incidents across the state. Um, and if we go back to the uh, how we thought about the you know what what constituted an incident and uh, and how useful it would be, um, you know it had to have the you know, complex and cascading. So it just didn't have to be large. It could be complex or it could be something that we were learning from. Um, so these were the uh, these are the 27 that we distributed across the state. 
there'll, be, there'll be many people in the audience today who would have been involved with those um, those incidents. And again, uh, certainly some were highly extended and some were really quite focused. Uh, certainly thank you for uh, taking the opportunity to sit down and work with us to, um, to uh, work through that and, and come together and tell the story about what we learned from those particular incidents. Uh, we can see they're quite distributed across across the nation. Um, so WA, there's there's four. Northern Territory had two. Queensland two. Um, this is not a competition, but certainly New South Wales. Um, it really, really difficult year with lots and lots of events. Uh, really major events. Uh, so the ten uh, different events that, that were there. Uh, one major one for Victoria. One for Tasmania. Uh, three in South Australia. And particularly interestingly, last year, if those who, you know, we may forget that we actually had three major international deployments. And I think uh, uh, Jackie might, might speak to those a little bit later. So um, they were the major incidents that were spread across, uh, across, the, uh, across the nation. And we'll, and we'll see that uh, they also weren't just um, of all of one nature. Um, we have floods, we have cyclones and storms, uh, bushfires, um, We've had earthquake events in the international arena, um, hazardous material events, uh, dam events. Uh, so both technical and uh, and natural hazards uh, ex existing in, in all of those. Next slide, thank you. So um, not only not only would we have a lot of different types of events this year. Um, we can see from the from the map then a really you know what you know the the scale of uh, of impact that these had uh, across the nation by uh, by looking at the the number of uh, initiations of uh, recovery funding from those events and so we've used that as a bit of a quasi uh, map to demonstrate how uh, to demonstrate uh, the extent uh, of this and how. Uh, how disruptive uh, this has been across the nation. Uh, but not only is it just that uh, people had single events, there, uh, there is records there of up to some local government areas, sorry, this is by uh, LGA, um, by some local government areas having up to four different uh, initiations of recovery uh, in that financial year. So some real focus areas uh, with people having uh, multiple events in, in, that, in those locations. Uh, I think that's, that map tells a very, very strong story. Um, next, next, please. So out of, out of the 27 events, um, we, can, we, uh, we went through the process with the, with the, um, uh, with the guidance of the committee um to to work through which of those would be the case study so which of those we're going to uh, were of a, both a scale uh of incidents but also things that might might uh, speak to us a little bit about uh, about lessons that we might learn from those um and of course the uh, case study number one in there was the murray darling basin floods um, for New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, extremely extended event, uh, many people involved, many people quite familiar with that. Uh, case study number two, we had uh, the North Coast storms and floods in Tasmania. And one of the key things there was that uh, we're looking to highlight that uh, there'd been a very similar footprint in 2016 and uh, the changes in consequence that had come about through some of the work that had happened in Tasmania. Uh, bushfires on the Western Downs was case study number three. Um, and I think there the, uh, the Queensland colleagues were looking to highlight that uh, the extended and depth of bushfire season, uh, things which they hadn't actually experienced before about uh, as bushfire season pushed into their uh, traditionally non-bushfire season. Um, case study number four, uh, we had uh, the Canberra Recycling Fire. So uh, um, this was a, quite a, a nice representation of systemic risk small, uh, small, uh, well, relatively speaking, small event with a big consequence. Um, poorly managed, or not poorly managed, but battery, uh, lithium battery fire, damaged into a recycling plant, and then uh, repercussions right across the ACT and New South Wales around uh, recycling. 
Bushfires in the central region, just extensive, uh, extensive bushfires and extensive uh, bushfires in New South Wales uh, on top of the, the flooding events. So uh, the continuity of, of uh, demands that were there. Northwestern Western Australia flooding uh, for the West Australia and Northern Territory. Um, now Rick's going to talk extensively about that a bit later on, but uh, a great, uh, great understanding of that, uh, the complexities of uh, the managing of that particular event. Tropical low flooding in the Northern Territory. Again, another disruptive event, uh, remote, complex, and a, a really strong partnership in there between New South Wales and the Northern Territory. Um, hazmat radiological event in, uh, in the Western Australia. Um, again, another very complex, uh, high profile event uh, with national and state co coordination and cooperation on that one. And uh, the dam failures for for Chunga, uh, Chunga dam failures in South Australia. Uh, this this incident uh, reflects um, not only those particular, and there was a second event very shortly afterwards. Not only that, but uh, a, a widespread uh, risk exposure that sat within South Australia around uh, the management of dams. So they were the uh, they were the nine case studies that were put forward um, and uh, and presented in the report. Uh, very happy with with those, and uh, very thankful to all of those expert contributors who basically did all the hard work in in getting that together, and getting that out back to us. Um, so the uh, yeah, just reiterating that uh, diverse nature of events, uh, re raising scale, different hazards, different levels of complexity and uh, even some systemic risks and supply chain, sorry, management, sorry, impacts on systemic, sorry, community systems, uh, particularly supply chains. So there, there are the uh, case studies, um, and uh, I think that people will really enjoy reading those. Uh, and just, so just on the final, my final slide, and, and Rick again will speak more to this, but I think this is a, one of the pictures, one of the... Uh, uh, pictures that came through to us through the process, and it really, it really struck with me. And it's just not that not only do emergency services respond when we have events, but the community responds. When we look at the scale of events that we had across across the nation, uh, I felt that this uh, really told a very, very strong, very strong story about uh, how people pull together during emergencies. Uh, so really, that image, of course, was courtesy of uh, Andrea Myers. Um, but look, certainly a, a striking uh, way to, to finish my part of the presentation. So thank you. And that's for me. Uh, fabulous. Thanks, Daryl, uh, and giving us the the the, you know, the, the, the kick off. Um, it was fantastic just to get a, get a sense of both process and and the sorts of different events and and how you perceive them. And certainly want to thank you for the really hard work uh, that you did in uh, uh, bringing this all together. So next, um, I really want to welcome uh, Jackie Cristiano, the Director of Crisis Analysis and Planning at the National Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and she's going to give us uh, uh, the way the reports were structured is, you know, we, we have a national overview. So, so she's just going to give us a, a few uh, reflections on that. Uh, national overview before we get into uh, the, uh, a great case study. Uh, just a reminder, if you've got some questions, whack them in the Q&A, please. Uh, that would be great. But feel free to continue the conversation going on in the chat as well. Over to you, Jack. All right. Awesome. Hopefully everyone can hear me. All right. We'll make a start. So um, as John mentioned, um, Oz Music uh, Day, my favourite band has to be In Excess. And as a, as a teenager, I was actually an in accessory. Um, Got to love that. Um, so, look, I think um, we spend a lot of time and energy dealing with the current crisis, but I think it's really important to just take the moment to remember where we've been. And I think that's why this um, major incidents report is actually so important. Um, it's the annual record of the major incidents from a national perspective. And it's a, just a, a really fantastic report for that reflection. Um, on behalf of NEMA, I'd really like to extend my appreciation to all involved in the development and the writing of the reports. And thank you. 
And we also acknowledge the significant impact of these and many other events on our communities. Um, and we pay our respects to the family and friends of those that have lost their lives in disasters, both in Australia and overseas, and pay our respect to those that have lost so much and um, very grateful to everyone, first responders, community recovery, everyone involved in the emergency management system for all that you do to support um, people going through these um, situations and events. Um, the major incident report though, isn't just that valuable historical record of interesting case studies. Um, my personal favorite though, in the um, case studies is the hazmat radiological case study number eight, where I was actually team leader of the crisis coordination team at the National Emergency Management here, um, who had carriage of that. So it just goes to show the, the variety of work that we're all involved in. But as um, Joe, um, Deputy Coordinator General here at NEMA mentions in the reports forward, studying these major events can positively contribute towards increased preparedness for future years when we highlight and share those significant learning points, we can all benefit and the emergency management sector as a whole can really improve. Um, Australia has been impacted by these natural hazard events such as bushfires, cyclone and floods. And we're seeing it just at the moment as well with the, the last few weeks, fires in, in Western Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland, flooding again just in the last couple of days. And with this changing climate that we're facing, the severity and frequency of these natural hazard events we know is expected to increase and impact more people, places, property, and more often. So we really need to learn from past experiences to create that disaster resilient, um, resilient Australia. And we need our communities to be really pre well prepared for natural hazard events. But we also know that these are going to take time. It's going to get, take time to get to that goal um, of building a disaster resilient Australia. So in the interim, we're really quite focused here on um, having uh, increased investment and effort and time focused on boosting disaster preparedness and response, and especially um, working on those gaps present in the capability and capacity to respond to these events, both domestically and internationally. We know that there's a whole range of capacity and capability shortfalls in the disaster management. Um, sector, and that's due to a wide range of factors like workforce shortages, declining resources, and the necessity for so many communities to focus on disaster recovery. We also know, though, that many of us are not operating in response to just natural hazard events. We're collectively responding to and managing a wide range of crises and events, including the cyber attacks of, of just recent, infrastructure outages, biosecurity incidences. We're facing an incredibly complex emergency management sort of picture. Um, and we also know that the world doesn't stop. So we have to continue to um, respond and be better prepared. Um, internationally, I think this is one area that um, holds a, a lot of interest and, and focus for many people as well. And you can see in the report about details of um, the deployment to Turkey, dealing with um, uh, helping New Zealand deal with ex-tropical cyclone Gabrielle, and also the deployment that went to Canada to help them with their wildfires. And people may not actually know at the moment, we're also dealing with um, the repatriation of people from the Middle East under the OSRECEP plan and helping with um, bringing people, uh, uh, both the Australian citizens and other approved foreign nationals back to Australia um, under that plan. So not every emergency is going to be an, a natural hazard event, but there is a lot that needs to be done and is being done. So um, thank you for contributions to this report. Um, I'll pass back to you. Thanks, John.
Thanks, Jackie. I think we need to add to your title uh, in accessory. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, great, great to have that um, overview, particularly that sort of thinking about that kind of systemic uh, element of that. Uh, so now we've gone, you know, wide, and we've we've gone really wide, so nationally and internationally. But now we're going to bring it back to sort of. Uh, rubber and, and hitting road and uh, really pleased to be introducing Rick Curtis as the Assistant Commissioner of Learning Development, Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. Uh, and I think Rick, you were a duty officer when a whole bunch of things happened, found yourself that. So uh, we've had quite a few conversations uh, about this. Really excited about this because uh, this is one of the kind of big case studies in, in the report and, and got a whole lot of complexity and interest in it. So uh, over to you, Rick. Um, and uh, yeah, also, we're interested in uh, your favourite artist as well. Well, uh, thank you, John, uh, and good morning for me, but good afternoon to all you folk in the uh, the eastern states. Look, I'll start by my favourite. Uh, being a Perth local, I'm going to claim in excess and ACDC for that matter. So I'll go in excess kick and ACDC back in black would be my pick and a shout out to a current day uh, band, Birds of Tokyo. Um, love their work. Uh, look, just a bit of context for DFES, and, and I thank you for your time. This is a great opportunity for us to talk through what was a very complex and major event for our state. Um, DFES is an all-hazard agency. It manages eight of the state's 28 hazards and uh, also manages state recovery across the full suite of state hazards. Um, as John mentioned, uh, I'm an assistant commissioner with DFES. I'm one of four duty assistant commissioners that rotate through the state operations environment as arguably what we would determine as state commander. Um, I had the fortune to be the state commander for the period in the lead up to this event and for the first 12 days um, of its impact. And I can tell you it was humbling, um, but also a very rewarding experience. Uh, next slide, thank you, Charlotte. Um, I come to you from the, the lands of the Wanjok, uh, Wajok Noongar people of the um, Noongar Nation, and uh, and I pay respects to their elders past and present, but I importantly want to call out the traditional owners from the lands across the Kimberleys, the, the amazing resilience that these communities and elders and leaders have shown through the response phase of this event but, and continue to show through what is an, a, an amazingly long recovery. Um, they are highly resilient, they are committed, and they're a wonderful community of Indigenous elders, and, and I respect them. Next slide, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, by way of, this is a really good overview to set the scene, I suppose. Um, you know, this part of our country, the northwest of, of Australia, is not immune and not inexperienced in wet seasons and flood events and cyclone events. But this one was out of the box um, in the sense that it came across the Northern Territory coast, as you can probably see by that track, um, and quickly became, uh, went from a tropical cyclone into a tropical low and moved throughout the Northern Territory for a period of time and crossed into uh, to Western Australia on the 29th of December. Uh, thank you, Northern Territory. And as it made its way uh, west, you can see by the track, it, it made a few loops um, upstream of Fitzroy Crossing. That is where the uniqueness of this weather event comes to light. Um, those loops, three in fact, were the primary cause of the water volume. Um, and in doing so, it dropped an amazing amount of water um, upstream in an area around D uh, Diamond Gorge in the vicinity of 870 millimetres of water. Now, to put that into context, uh, that's around 60,000 cubic metres per second of water, or three times the amount of water flow that that region would experience in a normal flood event. It's, in, it's amazing. Uh, by way of um, the loops, in addition to looping three times, it moved really slowly. So that volume of water was um, was immense. The, the lack of telemetry in that part of the state by way of water flow and, and river levels uh, also contributed to some of the unknowns of this and the complexity of this event. Uh, and then of course, uh, we, we saw what unfolded. By way of impact, um, I'll get to that, but I want to call out the, the peak floodwaters reached 15.81 metres, and that's in Fitzroy Crossing, and I'll give you some context in a slide to come. That's two metres higher than that part of the region had ever experienced before. Um, now, two metres of water in that part of the world is very significant. 
the water flow, um, that 60,000 cubic metres per second, to put that into context, in a day's water flow, uh, that was around what Perth Metro uses on consumption in 20 years. It's significant. Next slide, thanks, Charlotte. This satellite imagery is a good indication of that water flow. So top left, of course, is a normal environment and bottom right is during the event um, and what it looked like from space. So you can put into some context how much water uh, we're talking about. It is um, the pictures and graphics and video and, and footage just do not do it justice. justice. It, was, um, it was quite a sight to behold. Some of the, um, some of the river parts were 50 kilometers wide in places. And, uh, and then obviously there was significant inundation and isolation, which I'll get to in just a second. As, um, as the cyclone or ex-tropical cyclone, now tropical low moved its way around uh, the Kimberley, uh, it went across the broom and then came back and exited our state uh, on or around the 8th of January back into the Northern Territory and eventually dissipated. Um, but it left uh, quite a, a path of destruction, destruction throughout the couple of weeks that we had its um, had its presence. Uh, next slide, Charlotte. Thank you. So, by magnitude of water, um, it is these pictures just do not do us justice. Um, Fitzroy Valley uh, is home to so many different Aboriginal communities, remote Aboriginal communities, and the Shire of Derby, West Kimberley, is two and a half thousand kilometres from the capital city of Perth. Uh, and between 260 and 300 kilometres from their nearest neighbours in Derby and Halls Creek. And those, those factors and those statistics are really important in the sense of the remoteness of the area we're working in, but additionally, the ability to pre-supply and indeed resupply uh, that part of the country and get our people um, into that space to support the, the affected local communities. Um, there is there is a, a lot a lot of consideration and complexity around around that Fitzroy Crossing itself uh, has about a thousand people. It's got a, around five hundred and fifty dwellings, and I mentioned there are sixty nine other local Indigenous communities in and around um, the Kimberley. Next slide, thank you, Charlotte. So this will give you some context around the, the water volume and flow. Um, there were two, overall, there were two ways that this flood event impacted the Kimberley. One was through direct inundation, i.e. The, the property or the town became inundated and flooded, um, not too dissimilar to the Fitzroy Crossing Bridge that you're seeing on your screen now. The second way was through isolation. So where the town site or community was unaffected by flood water, it was cut off um, by main, um, main, main transit routes and indeed resupply routes, uh, which made the complexity of moving people uh, and also bringing supply and capability to those areas quite complex. The bridge itself, so top left, you'll see in dry state, um, normal times. And what you can see driving across in the top right of that photo is a road train. So I'll give you some context about how the bridge, how sizable this particular bridge is. Um, bottom of your screen is the 15.81 metres of water. Now, contextually, the tarmac of that bridge had never seen water in a flood event. That bottom left photo is two metres higher than the flood event or the flood waters have ever reached before. And the impacts you can see on the far right of your screen. Um, devastating for that community and that region, but also from a um, infrastructure and freight route supply, uh, very devastating to the northwest and indeed uh, Western Australia. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Charlotte. So in leading up to the event in that 29 December space, uh, as we understood the magnitude of the water flow and the limited telemetry to give us intelligence around what we were to expect because previous records were likely to be smashed. So our previous understanding of impacts was no longer relevant. We did a lot of work with um, Department of Water and BOM and our other intelligence internally um, of DFES to better understand and model what inundation was likely to occur from Fitzroy and then downstream in the following communities. And that proved pivotal in the sense that as we were able to more understand what the consequence of this event was likely to look like, we were able then target our limited resources to the front end of the incident to the higher priority uh, and risk of communities. And what you're seeing on your screen is just one of many aircraft. It's our um, RAC DFES rescue chopper um, evacuating high priority medical patients in a pre-impact sense. 
So as we were able to understand what level of inundation communities were likely, likely to expect and understand what risks exhibited in those communities, uh, we were then able to target our effort in, in putting them in, uh, taking them away from that area in the highest risk or highest priority groups. Now, um, as I mentioned, that's one of many aircraft. In the very front end of this event, we engaged through legislation, uh, local oil and gas um, utilities, heavy lift rotary aircraft, uh, in addition to our own and contracted fleet from the region, whilst we then awaited Commonwealth support by way of the ADF and, and others. Um, overall, it was just an amazing effort of people combining their knowledge, skills and attributes to better understand what this risk looked like, noting that we had never experienced this before. Next slide. Thank you, Charlotte. By way of impact, um, there was a lot. Um, there's two slides of this, so I'll skim through it quickly and allow you to read the statistics um, as I do so. Uh, by way of inundation, 155 homes, 285 were damaged, uh, 1,500 people were, were displaced and we evacuated 200 people. Now, 200 people or 1,500 people um, in a major emergency doesn't necessarily sound that many, but if you contextualise the environment that I'm talking about and our ability to move those people, um, that is significant complexity um, and moving them to where? The Kimberley area was likely to be inundated in very broad areas. So Derby and, and Broome were also affected. So we had um, a lot of interagency support and think tanking around how to deal with this. And we moved people to Derby, we moved them to Broome. We even considered moving them to Perth. However, the, the draw to country for these um, Indigenous local people was strong and we made a concerted effort to keep them close to country. And in the end, um, that proved quite beneficial um, culturally and from a recovery sense. It really set the scene to bring them back um, to the new normal. Uh, next slide, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, over 10,000 stock was lost. Um, now, what I haven't shown you and won't, but you can probably Google if you would like to, that satellite imagery and river flow imagery, um, those 10,000 stock, uh, the majority of them um, clearly drowned. Um, however, they were uh, washed out to sea. So there's some horrific footage of livestock being swept out to sea uh, through the Derby, Derby Peninsula, um, amongst other impacts. Now, um, the community was affected in many ways, uh, freight, resupply and the like. Uh, tourism, over a couple of years, we're expecting $50 million of impact uh, in the tourism sense. And clearly, um, from an environmental and um, public health perspective, there was really significant issues that occurred from this event and us continually being managed now through the long tail recovery on behalf of DFES and other um, state partners. So there was a lot going on. Um, we had to consider a lot of complexity in understanding what the impacts were, but importantly, then prioritising our efforts to deal with those, noting that um, where we were in the part of the state, where we were in the duration or the campaign nature of the incident, we had to target specific risk in, in a particular way. Next slide. Thank you, Charlotte. By way of clean up and damage assessment, we, um, we employed a very multi-agency approach in addition to bringing a local content to that. So top left of your screen, you'd see one of our damage assessments te uh, teams being moved around by the ADF uh, and they were, they were grouped in a sense of bringing multiple capabilities into a small team to better understand what those risks are and indeed impacts were and collate those from an intelligence sense to allow us to understand where we needed to move next. The cleanup teams um, went about their business in, a, in an amazing way. Uh, that environment by way of temperature, humidity, um, harshness of environment was extreme. And our people, um, both volunteer and career from across the state uh, and Commonwealth did an amazing job. Now the center photo, um, if I can make that out for you, that's a kitchen table in, in the foreground with some um, condiments sitting on it. Now, the floodwaters in most homes reached almost roof height. Uh, but as the floodwaters receded and the cleanup began, what you're seeing on the wall is black mould. So, so the temperature and humidity of the environment in, in uh, the Kimberley 
certainly created additional complexity for our people in moving through that cleanup space. One of the key attributes that I'll call out is bottom right. Um, we engage local people, local Indigenous representatives by way of community navigators. And they were able to partner with our teams, whether it be damage assessment, cleanup or other, to guide and link us better to, to local elders and local communities and allow us to work more collaboratively um, and culturally through those environments, noting some of the very sensitive impacts. Uh, bottom left is some of the good news stories around um, you know, rebuilding and replacing damaged uh, homes and infrastructure and working through and working with local communities to get them back to a new normal, noting that the recovery is still ongoing and will be for another, you know, 24, uh, 12 to 24 months. So a concerted effort, a multi-agency multi effort, but one with not, not without its um, risk and complexity. Thanks, Charlotte. So resupply. Uh, now, isolation and um, impacted communities, obviously. We, pre-wet season, go through a really strong pre-supply program in the northwest of our state, so communities are well equipped to withstand events for a period of time. But given the magnitude and duration of this event, uh, it was something out of the box. So we had to pull uh, a few tricks out of, out of the the magic box in order to continually supply and move people around out, out the northwest of our state and indeed resupply with critical medical fuel and food supplies across the affected communities of the Kimberley and in particular, particular the Fitzroy Valley. Um, on the top left, you'll see normal transit route in red, uh, by road that is. Uh, the challenge with that is it takes a couple of days to get to Broome and when you get to Broome during this flood event, you can't get across to Derby because the Roebuck Plain was flooded. So we were able to get stock toward Dampier and Broome, but not any further to the east into the affected areas. So some of the concepts we used um, in the other photos you'll see is barging. So we put those semi-trailers with produce and other supplies on barges and moved them around by sea uh, into Derby and then dispersed it through uh, the affected areas, either by road where possible or by air. And that's the photo on, on the bottom right you can see. Um, that was the front end of our resupply. Resupply lasted for about 10 weeks. Um, the, the magnitude, the nature, the impacts to communities was something of um, unforeseen and, and un, you know, unexperienced previously um, by way of magnitude. Had we have just had an, a road route, a redirected road route through South Australia and Northern Territory, uh, that road route alone is um, is days, three to five days to get produce and arguably the produce by the time I get there would not be uh, would not be usable. So complexity 101, uh, we rose above that and came up with some really um, unique ways of doing business. And I suppose while they, are, they were unique for this incident, they will become normal for us going forward. So Alt Flood Assist 23-1 uh, is supporting the community um, of Broome, Fitzroy Crossing and Derby. The community has been decimated by floods and a lot of roads have been destroyed. So we're supporting them uh, predominantly with resupply, getting food and essentials into very, very hard to reach places with both our, uh, both our fixed wing assets um, coming from RAF and rotary wing coming from the 5th Aviation Regiment. So available for the relief effort, we've got two C-27J Spartans from 35 Squadron and a C-130J Hercules from 37 Squadron. And operating with the Army rotary wing assets, we're using those aircraft to transport food and evacuees in and out of the Fitzroy Crossing and Derby areas. The response phase is, is somewhat transitioning more to a, uh, a clean up and recovery phase and we're working close with all of our partners to expedite that process. The ability to move large volumes of people in a timely manner, in a coordinated manner, is I think where Defence is going to really support our, our effect. Thanks Charlotte. 
uh, next video. Whilst the, the uh, feed was a little broken, it is online. So if you wanted to watch that online, you can certainly access that. And what it called out was just the significant effort from, um, you know, a state and Commonwealth aspect. In that part of our country, uh, certainly a state approach was not, not viable on its own. What this slide takes us to is, is early recovery, relief and emergency um, recovery, and, and that's setting the scene for that resupply mission and then longer tail recovery. The, the couple of photos that I'll draw your attention to, um, top right is uh, Fez Commissioner Darren Clem AFSM on the ground in Fitzroy. Uh, top left is our Emergency Services Minister, Stephen Dawson, uh, MLC on ground, and him um, meeting with traditional and local elders in Fitzroy Crossing, bottom left. Bottom right is uh, is the ADF moving our people from, from Perth and, and other areas in the state into the affected area. And the one thing I want to call out, you can see the numbers in the centre of your screen around how many people were engaged in this event, uh, which is significant, uh, moving that amount of people into that part of the state and sustaining and maintaining that capability for nearly two, three months was just an outstanding effort, an amazing one. The point I'll call out in this photo is the number of different coloured uniforms. That is what success looks like in this type of event. Success is based on the multi-agency effort, both state and Commonwealth. Um, these, these types of disasters by way of magnitude cannot be dealt with in isolation by any one agency. Um, and the, the combined effort um, was just amazing. The camaraderie and effort was, was outstanding. Um, and I'd call that out to everyone involved. Thanks, Charlotte. Next slide. A quick overview of what recovery is now looking like. The structure for something like this um, is at its very highest at the state level. You can see by that graphic um, how it was represented. That's not something that our state recovery team has grown to before. This, this was a first of type, arguably a first of type. Um, and as I mentioned, the uniqueness of those resupply efforts becoming normal as will this recovery structure start to become more normal as our state recovery team starts to grow and understand better how to deal with larger and more um, impactful disasters. Uh, the recovery structure itself had buy-in from uh, senior officers, senior uh, public servants across all agencies involved, right up to and including um, the cabinet from state government. Next slide, thank you, Charlotte. Just a quick overview of what recovery looked like over, over the journey. Um, you can see from left to right some of the targets around what recovery looked like early and then progressing into that longer tail recovery. Just an outstanding effort by everyone involved um, and, I applaud, uh, and I applaud the efforts by everyone. Uh, last slide, thanks Charlotte. That's what the Fitzroy Bridge looks like. Um, it is uh, a few days, a weeks away from being repaired. An amazing effort. Have a look online. That is a feat of modern infrastructure that is beholding to see. So well done, everyone. John, back to you. Thank you. Uh, fabulous. Thanks, Rick. What an uh, incredible and complex um, uh, incident that you've had to deal with over in the West. And I think one of the one of the reasons why we're really keen to to um, to focus uh, on this one complexity, but also it is in the West, and uh, those of us over east here, uh, you know, we tend not tend not to um, uh, sort of understand uh, some of the issues and the complexities that, that do happen in managing uh, emergencies in some of the most remote places uh, in in the country. So, thanks, Rick, um, for that great overview. Um, and look, I'm going to we're just going to move on really quickly now. So, I'm uh, really delighted to uh, introduce my colleague Isabel Corns, uh, who's a project officer with us here, um, with me in the uh, knowledge development team. And she's going to, sort of leading on from what um, Jackie was sort of saying to talk about those, the complexity of sort of systems, just going to uh, give us a, um, an overview of a piece of work that we did that's a companion uh, to the major incidents report. So uh, floor is yours, Isabel. Thanks, John. Um, and yeah, as John mentioned, I have the pleasure of presenting Ada's first ever Australia's Riskscape report, uh, which is a companion to the, this year's major incidents report and a companion to the Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook. So while we were developing the major incidents report, we really wanted to actively think about systemic risks and how these risks might be playing a role 
in the incidents that were detailed in this year's major incidents report. So we've heard from our previous presenters that there are a whole range of factors um, that are influencing the risks from hazards, how we're responding to hazards, um, and then how we begin that very um, often long journey of recovery. So we're observing that recovery, preparedness, response for the next hazard or hazards uh, are increasingly happening at the same time, and this isn't a linear process of easy to define stages. So this document isn't designed to be a comprehensive report, but rather a snapshot of things um, that have been going on in the system that may have influenced people's capacities to reduce their risk, to respond to these hazards, and to begin to undertake that psychological and physical re uh, recovery journey from the incidents that happened during the, the previous financial year. We also had a look at some of the research into medium and longer term trends, both nationally and globally, that are likely to have implications for Australian society into the future, and that we really should be considering in our thinking and planning for future hazards. Next slide, please, Charlotte. So briefly, what are we talking about when we talk about systemic risk uh, and riskscapes? These emerge from the interactions between climate change and natural, biological and technological hazards and the complex interdependent and interconnected networks of social, cultural, technical, environmental and economic systems. So these risks are not necessarily obvious using traditional hazard by hazard risk assessments and revealing them requires an understanding of the degree of magnitude of failure across these systems that could suddenly or gradually exceed society's capacity to cope. Um, and I think when I say the words Optus outage and the cascading consequences for 10 million customers, including emergency services, the transportation network, businesses and individuals over 14 hours. Um, this is just one example of a system that is often invisible, um, but deeply inter interconnected. And there are serious implications when part of this system fails. Next slide, please, Charlotte. So we can't see these risks as isolated. And this fantastic image, which we uh, use in the report from the World Economic Forum, is a really helpful way to visualize this idea at the global level, which then plays down to the national and to the local level. Um, it's really critically important that we move beyond linear understandings of risk and consequence to understand how and very importantly, why these systems are interconnected and what the implications are of these interconnections for understanding our risks, but also our capacities. So my only minor alteration to this image is removing the natural from natural disasters at the top. Um, because understanding risk systemically reinforces that disasters are not natural, um, but they're the result of the, de the decisions we collectively make as a society. So next slide, please, Charlotte. So we framed up the report um, into the following very broad categories of factors and provide some examples of these systemic kind of things that we're, that were going on in the lead up to and during the 2022-23 Period. So some of these things are considering the recovery environment. So there was the ongoing recovery still from the Black Summer 1920 fires, the flooding events over 2020 to 2022, along with COVID, of course, um, the social and health considerations. So existing inequalities, changes in um, levels of social cohesion, which have dropped since the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, trust in institutions, which has been steadily falling globally, uh, the ongoing implications of COVID-19, we're currently in another wave, um, and the mental health and well-being of the, of the wider population, things like climate anxiety and the mental health um, implications of those lockdowns that many of us were in. So there was economic considerations, the growing insurance costs and the, possible, the possibility of uninsurability, um, un and underemployment, housing insecurity, interest rate rises, cost of living rises um, and supply chain issues, environmental considerations such as environmental degradation, um, and we touch on the sort of positives and negatives of flooding, technological considerations, so cybersecurity challenges, um, remote working, a high reliance on communications technology, and this really rapidly changing landscape of AI. Um, and finally, of course, the climate considerations, which we go into in much greater depth in the major instance report, um, La Nina, the negative Indian Ocean Dipole, and the positive Southern Annular Mode. So that's my very brief five-minute crash course in systemic risk and our new Riskscape report, and I'll hand it back over to John to close us off. Thanks, Isabel, for you know, the whirlwind tour of, of systemic risk uh, and, uh, and our thinking, and we're really... Um, 
pleased and proud to be kind of thinking, uh, being able to sort of draw this out and, and just set it, you know, alongside the major incidents report um, as, you know, another, uh, certainly another way of, of thinking about disaster risk. We do, we do as a Sendai framework, uh, so, um, asks us to do or, or you know recommends we do we really need to be thinking about the systemic risk uh, we're at a time which is um, unfortunate uh, so in terms of um, the I know there's a couple of questions there what we might do is I'll um, we'll, I'll get the panelists to to answer those and, and we'll look at uh, when when we um, when we uh, finalise the, the the presentation, uh, we'll make sure that they get answered in in the um, in the sort of email uh, that that we send out. So um, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for your time uh, today and and joining us on this uh, uh, sort of broad and uh, sort of wild uh, uh, tour of, of uh, major incidents across the country and internationally and systemically. So uh, I'd like to thank Daryl, Jackie, Rick and Isabel for their time and effort in pulling together, as you will all agree, a, a, a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, also like to thank uh, Charlotte and Juanita in our, in our events team for they're the people behind us who, who make all this happen. So uh, make it all go, go um, smoothly. Um, if you can, um, if you can answer our short survey, which is in the chat, uh, that's really helpful because that certainly helps us uh, uh, do, uh, you know, work out what we're doing, whether we're doing it well, and what we can do better, and what we can, how we can meet your needs. So, um, thanks everyone. Go well, uh, and um, look forward to seeing you again in another one of these. Um, uh, uh, webinars in, in the near future. Thank you for your time today.